Hi, I'm Rhys Lawton and this is Mainstream Media, watching the mainstream news so you don't have to. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. So let's all gather round the week's news, chuck it on a bonfire with a can of petrol and dance around its flames! I don't get out much. <laughs> The 2020 Downing Street Christmas party. Legendary. Were you there? Of course not. It never happened. Am I right? <laughs> the whole one rule for them, another for us plebs, is really starting to cut through. So the Prime Minister took decisive action. The Prime Minister and uh, Carrie uh, have, uh, are celebrating the birth of their second child, uh, a baby girl born in a London hospital in the uh, early hours of this morning. Boris, Carrie and their daughter were welcomed home to number 10 by 50 of their closest journalists who asked to remain anonymous. Not the only distraction tactic. The Downing Street flat refurb rows back. Tories find nearly £18,000. Don't think they planned that one. But the one they did, yes, it's time for Covid Plan B for bullshit. More rules from a government that didn't follow the last lot. Work from home if you can. No actual support this time, just have a go. More masks, vaccine passports, even hint at mandatory jabs. That'll throw everyone off the scent. Parties, though? Actually, they're fine. Knock yourself out. Weird. Last year, you had to pretend a knees-up was a work thing. This year, if you want to see colleagues, say it's a party. Will it all work? Not sure. Better get the other story straight, too. Go through the lies again. Oh, lines. Yes, there was no party, unless they find out there was, in which case it wasn't a party, it was something else. And even if it was a party, which it wasn't, all the Covid rules were followed. Rules that banned parties. But we're fine, cos there wasn't one. Thank God no one has anything on tape. I've just seen reports on Twitter that there was a Downing Street Christmas party on Friday night. Do you recognise those reports? <laughs> I went home. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on. Um, uh, uh... Would the Prime Minister condone uh, having a Christmas? <laughs> What's the answer? I don't know. I didn't... Wasn't the party? It was cheese and wine. Just clear, it's not on Is cheese and wine all right? No. It was a business no. meeting. <laughs> I'm joking. This is recorded. This fictional party was a business meeting. <laughs> And it was not socially distanced. Awkward! So bad, two of the main Tory cheerleaders admitted they'd seen it, while others were very concerned with remote working and the weather. Several of our newspapers, the major newspapers, The Sun and The Telegraph, for example, I think The Times as well, not the lead story, not even on front pages. This government gets away with an awful lot more than most governments. Yes, we saw the PM's head of digital, Ed Oldfield, practising briefings with then-press secretary Allegra Stratton, just four days after the thing that wasn't a party. They scrapped Allegra's role soon after. Wise. And she wasn't long for her current job either, whatever it was she was actually doing. Can you stop, please? Can you stop? I'm going to make a statement. You don't... Um, the British people have made immense sacrifices in the ongoing battle against COVID-19. I now fear that my comments in the leaked video of the 20th of December last year have become a distraction in that fight. My remarks seemed to make light of the rules. Rules that people were doing everything to obey. That was never my intention. I will regret those remarks for the rest of my days and I offer my profound apologies to all of you at home. Yes, those remarks did seem to make light of it, didn't they? Probably the laughing that did it. If it all never happened, why have you quit? Hey, didn't she used to co-host with Robert Peston on ITV? We're sort of, you know, sort of almost sort of losing common sense here. Quite a statement coming from him. They literally look as if they are laughing at us. Easy, Tom. They're not worth it. Seems like an open and shut case, though. Viewers will make their own mind up about whether this is proof the December the 18th Downing Street Christmas party actually happened or just a peculiar coincidence. I think that's meant to be sarcastic. At least, I hope it is. I mean, dozens of people in number 10 for booze, food and a secret Santa. The last one alone implies some kind of planning. Unless the Santa was so secret that not even Santa himself knew. There were at least two other parties in Downing Street in November when the whole country was in lockdown. They should be investigated too, shouldn't they? Well, I think the Prime Minister has already uh, said uh, tonight that um, the Cabinet Secretary Simon Case will look at uh, any allegation. Yeah, they won't say if the guy leading the investigation was there himself either. And yes, all kinds of shenanigans. Leaving dues, Christmas bashes, a quiz. We had a bit for, for Hanukkah, we turned the Christmas 
lights on, all sorts of things in, in number 10, uh, and in accordance with the rules as, as you would expect. Not really what we're talking about. Classy. Try to spread the blame about a bit. Other faiths, kids we had round to switch the lights on, maybe Dylan the dog. They're all just as bad as partying when it's literally illegal. We won't be having a Ministry of Justice-wide uh, Christmas party. Bit late now, mate. Your staff must be pissed off, and not just because they work for you. Surely you've asked if the event took place? I asked if, if, if an event took place and if uh, no regulation, if any regulations were broken, and I was assured none were. So you do know the event took place? Well, I don't know if it was an event. I don't know what the nature of it was. Should we call uh, it I a gathering? That... Call it a party! Because that's what it was, wasn't it? Despite Allegra's best efforts? No one serious is going to buy it. It wasn't a sort of official invite kind of thing, but people had been invited mm. to come into number 10. There was food and drink laid on. Uh, there were even some games and... I mean, that's a party, isn't it? You know a party when you see one, Chris. It is odd, though. A massive do at Downing Street and no journalists seem to know about it. What the hell are they being paid for? Maybe the public can have a go instead. Even the ones they get on Question Time would do better. Mob rule! Nothing like it. I've been reassured that all guidance was carefully followed as it continues. <laughs> Does that answer your empty. question? No. I guess it is panto season. Did you really need to ask the audience? What happened to journos telling ministers they're talking crap? While the heavyweights stumbled, those outside the bubble had no trouble calling it out. They weren't celebrating. No. They didn't have a party. They categorically deny any suggestions that they had a party. <laughs> and this fictional party definitely didn't involve cheese and wine <laughs> or a secret Santa. Evening, Prime Minister! Hey! For now. Second time in a few weeks they've been doing the political satire. You're wasted in the castle, lads. Even former footballer Gary Neville thought he'd have a go. You remember him, don't you? Scored twice for England, both own goals. Are we going to stand for this, he typed furiously. He's written to his MP, hasn't he? Don't hold your breath. Actually, I like to imagine that when the armies of darkness are smashing the free press once and for all, standing alone in the rubble will be Gary Neville sending a snippy letter. Probably two of them, accidentally, to his own address. Or maybe those armies needn't bother if this is the kind of reaction we get. Workplace gatherings that had a kind of business right. purpose were a bit of a kind of caveat, weren't That's they? That's right. They were a bit of a grey area. Anyone else aware of that last year? No, me neither. Oh, yeah, the then Education Secretary, who also had 24 of his closest work colleagues for drinks and canapes. Go away. It should shut up. It's not just the press failing to do its job. Seems the police are sewn up too. They don't normally look back and investigate things that have taken place. Here we go. That can't be true. Almost £1 million in fines have been issued for breaking those regulations. Even the star had a go. Yes, officer, I did rob that bank, but in the past! The Metropolitan Police weirdly backed the deputy PM. They apparently don't normally look into retrospective breaches and say there's no new evidence. This fictional party was a business meeting. <laughs> and it was not socially distanced. I didn't imagine that, did I? No one would surely try to argue that because Covid rules are under the Public Health Act 1984, which doesn't apply to Crown land, Number 10 has a get out of jail free. That would only highlight that there really is one rule for them and another for us. <laughs> oh, the spectator just did. Whose political editor is Mr Allegra Stratton, James Forsyth? If that's the reasoning by the government and the police, maybe tell us? Then go hide in a cupboard. And isn't there meant to be one of the boys in blue stationed outside Downing Street at all times? Couldn't get there quick enough when there was a vigil for a young woman murdered by a serving police officer they so desperately needed to break up. Priorities. Now, we've lived in a post-truth, post-shame world for a while now, but this one does seem different. Why do ministers think they can get away with such obvious double talk? The answer could lie with bad Santa himself, Dominic Cummings, the PM's former chief advisor and Brexit guru. Not normally a bringer of the light. He's the one who single-handedly undermined the first lockdown with a ludicrous 300-mile trip to Durham and an even more crazed defence of a day out to Barnard Castle. We agreed that we should go for a short drive to see if I could drive safely. Yeah, the world's most dangerous eye test. I once burnt my house down to check that my smoke alarms were working. He's been busy since he was forced out, actually just before the infamous party. 
Maybe he found out he wasn't invited. Caught leaving with his secret Santa, a shit in a box. Mr Cummings, any plans for when you leave? Yes, many plans. Mostly leaking dirt he's got on people. And now he claims not only that Number 10 is lying, but that some journalists were there too and are trying to bury the story. Now, be fair, you can trust this guy as much as the bloke who tells kids there's a grotto in the back of his transit van, but it would explain why the government is so confident that it can brazen it out. Don't know who was there, but maybe they can tell us exactly what went on. I'm sorry, you journalists are concentrating, aren't you? Trying to remember if you were at the party? No, that's not Sajid Javid, the health secretary. Even he's confused. It's Nadim Zahawi. You probably meant the vaccines minister, although also that isn't him. Zahawi's at education. All very odd and a little bit racist. Stay behind after the party. I mean, the not party. If only the government spent as much time taking a firm line on the stuff that really matters. Take the mess that is foreign travel. There they can't U-turn quickly enough. Hey, guys, maybe pre-departure tests for those coming in. New variant, etc. <laughs> nah, don't bother. Way too far. You know, I see the opposition calling for, you know, lock it all down, pre-departure tests, pile the cost on the travel. A lot of your listeners are people who love to travel. And I don't want us to go to back to the bad old days. Ah, good. Except, no, 48 hours later... We have also decided to require pre-departure tests. Everyone is on message, right? Was your colleague Grant Shapps, the Transport Secretary, right when he said just two days ago that doing this would kill off the travel sector? Well, look, the uh, Grant is very uh, plugged into the travel sector. Yeah, just not very plugged into the government, I guess. What about the vaccination programme? Nearly two weeks since the government said it would be put on steroids. Not the best analogy. And you've guessed it, it hasn't been. What it has decided to concentrate on, and you'll like this, is getting the guy from Spandau Ballet and EastEnders to dress up as Santa. Yes, really. This winter, vaccinations are the best form of protection to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe. So whatever you've got planned, it's not too late to get vaccinated. Maybe ask him if he can take a look at the website instead of dicking around in a red suit. Or threaten people into getting jabbed up like his Dirty Den character back in the day. Here's your divorce papers, Ange. Merry Christmas. Oh, that's not the guy? Who did he play then? Damn, doesn't matter. But getting tougher, is that the answer? Compulsory vaccines. The PM says that we need a national conversation. OK, so weird parts of Europe are going there, but we'd never do that in the progressive West, would we? Our health commissioner will announce a vaccine mandate for private sector employers. Ah, fair enough. No messing. Pin them down and get them jabbed. Other countries are now moving towards mandatory vaccination. And I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that uh, wholesale straitjacket mandatory vaccinations... You again? Uh, Mr No Fun this year. What about the wholesale straitjacket mandatory vaccinations for those in the NHS and social care? Other than in those settings where it's really required. Ah, no mandatory vaccines except when they are. Have you touched base with the health secretary? No, not Nadeem Zahawi. Stop reading the Telegraph. All this utter crap is exactly the kind of shot in the arm the Labour leader needed. Well, no, he could barely get a literal shot in the arm. All right, shall I take my... Uh... Yes, that's right. That's not quite sense, is it? And my jacket as well? Unless you want the needle ripping through that expensive-looking coat, why not? Keep calm. Carry on with your Christmas plans. Maybe he should add, for now. Plan B. Sure, that's not interfering too much with the festive stuff. What about the week after next? Even more rules? Good luck getting anyone to follow them. Nice time for a bit of paternity leave, eh, Boris? <laughs> For a Tory government up to its bloodshot eyeballs in Covid rule-breaking, sleaze and Brexit, mostly, no, all of its own making, choosing which one to focus on first is yet another big problem. The answer? None of them. Too hard. Find something else. Yes, the Prime Minister is now very interested in where the casual drug user is getting their supply. It's a stressful life at the top. Needs a bit of a pick-me-up. Forgive me. Forgive me. No, he's not after a hit himself. He's having a war on the white stuff. No, not that bad. That's the weather forecast. Yes, a war on drugs to clean up Gotham's crime-plagued streets, said The Sun on Sunday. Well, we're looking at doing things to tackle uh, th those so-called lifestyle uh, drugs users who, who don't think that they're part of the problem. Talking of dodgy gear, is he allowed to wear that? 
Auditioning for line of duty? Inviting them to a gathering? I mean, OK, Prime Minister. The drugs don't work, sang Boris. They make you worse. They're not going to make you cool. With all the appeal of a church youth group leader turning his chair around backwards. Tough penalties for middle-class drug users is the plan. And they'll get a scare, too. Passports seized. Police using dealers' phones to text users to ask them if they need help. Guess it's easier than chasing down leads. Why not just hand yourself in? Save us the bother. Investigating crimes, especially illegal parties, which happened last year, all too much like hard work. OK, it's a nice change from pinning the blame on vulnerable kids drawn into a life of crime. Yes, it's those rich kids who dabble a bit and think no one will get hurt, isn't it? Those who think they'll try it for a laugh, a one-off, a quick bit of blow. A single inconclusive event that took place when I was a teenager. Yeah. Th those kinds of people. Bit specific. Oh, wait, that's him admitting it, isn't it? Remember him saying he'd sneezed it out, too? Might have been icing sugar, he said. Of Course it was. What a waste of good icing sugar. How fortunate, Prime Minister. Bit more exciting than his predecessor, who got her kicks running through fields of wheat, but more honest than her predecessor, who would only say, in relation to his uni days, there are things I did then that I don't think I should talk about as a politician. Like nobbing a pig, for instance. Peppa Pig world is, is very much my kind of place. Maybe not so different, you and he. And he is right. Peppa Pig world's great. No, I mean about the drugs. Kids, say no to drugs or you'll end up as uncool as Boris or that kid from Grange Hill who got hooked on heroin and the acting work dried up. By an extraordinary coincidence, the PM's interest was piqued the same day the Sun stablemate, the Sunday Times, said it had found coke deep in the heart of Parliament. I'd be surprised if there wasn't uh, somebody taking uh, drugs at some point. Yes, it's everywhere, isn't it? Who's been a naughty boy? I'm a coke oh. addict. Oh, a total coke that, addict. That doesn't count, you square. Betty gets a bit excited every time the ad comes on. Holidays are coming. Makes you pine for the days of another Tory Chancellor, George Ozzy Osbourne, forced to deny taking Class A's after the papers published a picture of him cuddling up to a sex worker alongside a few piles of icing sugar. Anyone else got anything they'd like to fess up to? It is a mistake which I profoundly regret. Minister for Cutting Lines, I mean, levelling up, that's what we'll call it, Michael Gove, says he was lucky to avoid jail. Unlucky us. To be honest, would have been more surprising if the hacks hadn't found anything, especially with all those, yes, rule-breaking Christmas parties going on. I don't even think there were parties. They were parties and you weren't invited. Anyone that takes Class A drugs you know, they need to think about that supply chain that comes from Colombia, let's say, to Chelsea, and the number of lives that are destroyed along the way. Sounds like a great laugh. Chill out. Maybe you're better off with the dopey gang. Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab, Business Secretary Andrea Leadsom, and two former health secretaries have all said they enjoyed a puff. Actually, to be legally sound, all had a puff. They probably deny enjoying it. In fairness, politicians can't win. Those who dabbled are hypocrites, those who haven't don't have the life experience, do they, Rishi? Remember the Afghanistan withdrawal? Yeah, only back in August. Went really well, didn't it? Certainly seemed it from the coverage. They're just chanting death to America, but they seem friendly at the same time. Yeah, they're our mates, these guys we've spent a decade fighting, aren't they? The BBC even had its own hotline. Either that or they were conducting a seance. Can you speak, sir? Can, uh, can you just introduce yourself? Yes, uh, I'm uh, Mohammed Fahel Shahin, member of the negotiation team of the Islamic community of Afghanistan. Nice, peaceful transition of power, right? The young dudes are taking over. Look at all their trendy clothes. Seems a bit crass looking back. Actually, it was crass then, too. It was such a humiliating, blood-soaked surrender, it put even the French to shame. Yes, really, World War II material. I saw in the comments you thought I was a bit left-wing. This week, a whistleblower from the Foreign Office confirmed what I could have told them. Utter chaos. Thousands of emails unopened. Many left behind. A total lottery when it came to getting a flight out. And a foreign secretary without a clue. The media's just got wind of it, too. Forgive me for, for putting this so bluntly, Mr Rob. Sure. If you did uh, as good a job as you are suggesting, why aren't you you're still in that job? Well, the, uh, the, that's a decision for the Prime Minister. He was very clear with me um, that uh, uh, his decision uh, to move me to justice but also to uh, give me the role of Deputy Prime Minister was, uh, was not um, based on uh, Afghanistan. It better bloody not have been. The then Foreign Secretary apparently wanted cases in a well-presented table and refused to look at them until it was all nicely formatted. 
You can't rush these things, can you? Mass evacuation, get the font right. We did everything we could, but you have to have some form of process. In his case, the process involved sitting on a sun lounger in Crete, maybe rubbing some cream in occasionally. It's OK, though, he had a rubbish time, didn't he? The sea was actually closed. And what about the cause celebre that the papers went mad for? Pen farthing, action man crossed with Dr Doolittle, who got 150 rescue cats and dogs out of there. Not afraid to talk tough with those pen pushers to get the job done. I'm going to spend the rest of my time destroying you. Lovely chap. Give him a flight, chorus the media. He's a ballsy hero. No, said one government source, he's a shit knower. We need to get the soldiers and civilians out first. No chance we'll give him any help. That's bollocks, Nick. Um, uh, you know, I... I've been I've been watching, uh, listening to that. Frankly, I have to prioritise people at the moment over pets. Turns out, says the whistleblower, they did do exactly that. Put his animals ahead of UK nationals and Afghan refugees. Rumour even has it that the PM's animal-loving wife Carrie was involved, which the government denies. Not helped by a leaked letter from the PM's then private secretary actually authorising the flight. Ugh. But that is what I call a media balls up. Looking heartless at the time for not helping a hero and getting crapped on by the papers. And now looking like total shits because they supposedly did. Result! Shall we talk about the trial of the century? All going on in New York, isn't it? Prince Andrew, right, the Queen's favourite son, accused of all kinds of grim stuff. He flew on the late billionaire paedophile Jeffrey Epstein's Lolita Express, is the frankly revolting way some of the press put it. As if salivating over the lavish lifestyle wasn't crass enough when you're talking about sex trafficking children. Back to Andy. So he was recognised by Epstein's chief pilot. There, at the heart of it, all very damning. Oh, wait, what? Oh, uh, it says here, Ghislaine Maxwell. Sorry, got so wrapped up in the coverage. Yes, and he's not on trial, is he? As much as the British press really want him to be. Strongly denies everything. Got a rock-solid alibi, too. I'd taken Beatrice to uh, a Pizza Express in Woking. Convincing stuff from his Newsnight appearance. Can't argue with it. Can't have been dancing in the club with his accuser, Virginia Jeffrey either. Tell me why, Andy. Have a peculiar medical condition, which is that I don't sweat, um, or I didn't sweat at the time. Yeah, that, that was a revelation. Case closed. Oh, wait. Lawyers for Geoffrey say those denials are evidence of his guilt. Why? Because denying he remembered meeting her is so at odds with photographs and other evidence that it is itself indicative of guilt. Not really, though, is it? Admits it, guilty. Denies it, guilty. Talk to his lawyers. Case closed. Again. So, who's this Ghislaine Maxwell? Well, Epstein's right-hand woman. Or, if you like, the patsy they're trying to convict of his crimes because he inconveniently took his own life while awaiting trial. Suicide, right? Of course it was. Nearly half of Americans think he was bumped off. <laughs> what do they know? Friend of Andy's, too. Sure, bit awkward. Don't know why he's looking so happy, says the male. Well, maybe it's because he's got nothing to do with it. That's right. Case closed. I don't want to have to say this again. Lots of other rich and famous people were mates with Epstein, too. Former presidents Bill Clinton and Donald Trump. His star lawyer, Alan Dershowitz. And billionaire world saviour Bill Gates. Many, yes, OK, including the Duke of York, continued to be friends even after he was convicted of two sex offences, one involving a child. Though some had good reason. Right? I had dinners with him. Uh, I regret doing that. He had relationships with uh, people he said, you know, would give to Global Health, which is an uh, interest I have. You know, not nearly enough philanthropy goes in that direction. Billionaire needs cash for philanthropy. All a bit Jimmy Savile, isn't it? Except worse, tapping someone for charity work when they'd been convicted already. The accusations against Ghislaine? Sex trafficking children for Epstein. Six or eight charges, depending on your newspaper. Sometimes both. All of which she denies. I mean, you might have missed all the actual evidence. See, what you and I really need to know is how stylish is Ghislaine, right? Well, let me tell you. Glossy mane, beige cashmere jumper, black trousers, heels, obviously, all finished off with a pure white Covid mask. What a makeover since her dour days when she was trying to win bail. Funny, that. Most of the usual suspects followed the same line. There's the son. It's a sweater now because we're in America, aren't we? 
And are you sure about the colour there? The Express thinks it's more of a white and actually a turtleneck too, if we're being picky. The Telegraph? Curveball. Camel. That's her cardi, isn't it? Could be yellow. More importantly, she's worn it two days in a row. How humble. What does the Guardian... Really? You're going with this too? OK. Perhaps it's an off-white sweater. More cream, yeah. The Guardian did take the clothes talk a bit far, even for me, when it told us what Epstein's chief pilot Larry Vosovsky was wearing. Evidence was something about Epstein, but more interestingly, he wore a dark conventional suit, white shirt, red striped tie and monogrammed slippers. Delightful. If only there were pictures! That caused a bit of a sensation. It's all a conspiracy, right? They're trying to hush it all up. That's why there's no cameras in the court. No, the reason's more boring. They don't allow them in federal trials. So what's Ghislaine's story? Anyone willing to stand with her? Well, kind of. Here, journalist Rachel Johnson managed to drag in her brother, PM Boris. As if his week wasn't bumpy enough. She wrote a cringeworthy piece for The Spectator. It's hard not to pity Ghislaine Maxwell. You only know who your real chums are when you're in the gutter, writes Rachel. She goes on. As a fresher, I wandered into Balliol JCR one day and found a shiny glamazon with naughty eyes, holding court, astride a table, a high-heeled boot resting on my brother Boris's thigh. Is this still her column? Bit salacious. You know there's a sex trafficking trial on. The Speckies got form here with this kind of lightweight fluff about Ghislaine. Last year, Alan Dershowitz, friend of Epstein, remember, did the Ghislaine Maxwell I Know piece, saying he never saw her do anything inappropriate. Good to hear it. Ghislaine's extraordinarily well-connected in her own right. She's the daughter of Robert Maxwell, the papers remind us. The press baron who died falling off a yacht. Or did he? Yes, he did. But was it an accident? Yes, it was. I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, maybe for another day. Keep it light. The Daily Mail gives us a bit of family background. She's a bit haughty, just like her dad, isn't she? Chip off the old block. And from the Express, Maxwell was a disgraced media tycoon. Oh, yes, that's right! Used to own the Mirror newspapers. Looted hundreds of millions from the company pension funds to prop up the share price. The House of Cards collapsed after his death. Can't believe I forgot! You know who else forgot? The Mirror. Just a British socialite, isn't she? Friend of Prince Andrew. Sure, it's just an oversight. Nothing to do with opening old wounds. So the trial continues, as all good media reporting must say. Oh, there's something down here about Prince Andrew. Uh, did you hear me say case closed about a million times? Oh, wait, it seems next week is another deadline in his civil case. Never happened. Didn't you hear me earlier? I'd taken Beatrice to uh, a Pizza Express in Woking. I think that settles it, Andy. You're fine. Don't sweat it. <laughs> The freedom of the press, sacred, central to democracy, worth defending to the death, and it's under threat. Yes, a cold wind swept through Fleet Street this past week. Not that any of the papers noticed, they all left yonks ago. One for the hacks, sorry. But it was an icy blow for media freedom from the evil Queen Meghan, wasn't it? And only the Daily Mail saw what was going on. Will no one else stand up for what is right and just? Where's Gary Neville? <clears throat> oh, wait, the government spotted it too and will be taking action. These maverick judges are a law unto themselves, aren't they? So what happened? The relations between the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and elements of the press are at a sorry pass. But a court judgment today has, perhaps temporarily, shifted the balance of power towards the Sussexes. Oh, it's that spat between Meghan Markle and the Mail on Sunday again, isn't it? Coverage was a bit different in every other paper. She won a court case, didn't she? The Mail on Sunday lost. Even worse for them, lost an appeal. Judges said the first decision, ages ago, that the paper shouldn't have published a private letter to her dad was the right one. Sorry, not sorry. You're bang to rights. Oh, they're appealing to the Supreme Court. Maybe let it go. But why was the Daily Mail so angry then? The Mail Group delights in telling us that the Mail on Sunday, Daily Mail and Mail Online are separate titles, usually when trying to wriggle out of something. Of course they are, just happen to share a lot of the same content. But now the Daily and Sunday titles share the same editor. It's all a bit too obvious. If Meghan really wanted to fight for the truth, she would have gone to court, raged... Who? Oh, one of their columnists. Hey, that's not how it works, is it? You can't demand a trial. And why would she if she's already won? It's a bit naughty, too. The Mail accused the judges of being swayed by royalty. 
do love having a pop at our learned friends when they take a different view. Like when the paper branded them enemies of the people for daring to rule that MPs should get a say on Brexit. Totally missing the delicious irony that a sovereign parliament was exactly why it had told readers to vote Brexit in the first place. Anyway, don't let the law get in the way of your coverage. Here's all the questions Meghan should have been asked, whether you want them or not. Judgments should only be given on the basis of evidence tested at trial, said a respected independent legal expert. Uh, no, sorry, said a spokesperson for the Mail. It and others have all made a lot of Meg forgetting that she'd briefed the authors of a biography, saying she'd been meticulous about the letter in case it was leaked. The Mail tried to insist that it was proof she'd expected it might be published. Megan said she'd just accepted it might be possible. I guess like reining it in a bit if you're slating someone just in case it gets back to them. I'm sorry, I don't believe a word she says. Doesn't really matter what you think, though, does it, Piers? Yes, Morgan's been a relentless critic ever since well, she ghosted him. Quit his Good Morning Britain show when the weatherman had a go. I wouldn't believe it if she read me a weather report. And I understand that you don't like Meghan Markle. You've made it so clear a number of times on this programme. A number of times. And I understand that you've got a personal relationship with Meghan Markle or had one and she cut you off. She's entitled to cut you off if she wants to. Has she said anything about you since she cut you off? I don't think she has, but yet you continue to trash her. OK, I'm done with this. No, no, no. Sorry, no. Oh, uh, Sorry. So, do you know what? That's pathetic. You can trash me, maybe, not my no, own. No, no, no. See you later. I'm being... So... Sorry, can't this do this. This is absolutely diabolical behaviour. Good luck at Murdoch telly whenever that shitstorm begins. Despite the Mail's bizarre coverage, nothing about press freedom has changed. Quite simply, the law has been applied to stop titles publishing private letters that aren't in the public interest. And that doesn't mean that the public might be interested. But the most scary bit of the tale, the government's take. A change in the law. Really? Surely no government would bend to the press in quite that brazen a way. Well, this one might. A spokesperson said it's considering the implications of the judgment. Free press is vital, etc. Now, you might think it's all to pacify the mail, which in itself is a bit sinister. But Deputy PM and Justice Secretary Dominic Raab made things even clearer. I think that's a good example of the kind of balance that we can strike uh, with, a, with our own homegrown approach to this, rather than the over-reliance uh, on a, a, a continental model, which is effectively what the Human Rights Act has, has left us with. So the Justice Secretary still blaming that pesky EU, which we've left, for our own judges making their own judgments. And an overhaul is needed simply because the Mail on Sunday lost a court case. Yes, the government's decided it must be able to throw out decisions it doesn't like. Wait, that sounds like an overreaction, even by the Mail's standards. Sounds a bit like the government just fancies ignoring judgments it hates. And will use this as some kind of PR cover, with full backing from the male newspapers, of course. Now, I'm no fan of the Sussexes either. In fact, if you've got a minute, they're smug, sanctimonious wasters who use money to buy and control their image while jetting halfway around the world to lecture plebs about climate change. But the point of the law is that it doesn't discriminate against anyone, even total assholes. And tearing up the statutes because you don't like an independent judiciary, making independent decisions, are the ravings of the drunk bloke in the pub holding a beer-stained copy of the mail on Sunday. Unfortunately for us, that bloke's the deputy PM. <laughs> Much of the media seems a bit obsessed with a certain boy wizard, doesn't it? The papers and websites can't get enough of Harry Potter. Look, Harry's love interest, the one with the racist character name, now looks different after a decade and a half. Who'd have thought? Oh, there's that one you can't remember from it. She's in her mid-30s and having her fourth kid. Magical stuff. And her mum's made a Potter-themed tree from crap she found at the bargain stores. Endless fun. Weird, right? This strange spell it has. The last book's a decade and a half old. The film's finished ten years ago, too. Target audience pushing 40. All moved on, right? Why now? Why have a Harry Christmas? Well, there's some new stuff out for the festive season. Two new specials on Sky TV. Yes, that's right, for the 20th anniversary of the start of the movies, which was actually last month. Who are they for? Hands up who likes Harry. Uh, OK, out. Do your mum and dad know you're watching? I'm a bit of a Harry Potty mouth. For the rest, it's for kids! The films are shite versions of some pretty ropey books and the author's a bit persona non grata. No, that's not a spell, grow up. The specials, though. OK, fans might be a bit excited to see some new adventures for the ageing trio. Daniel Radcliffe's one of them. Emma Thompson, uh, sorry, Watson. Oh, wait, I think they're both in it. All right. And Ed Sheeran. We've all got both slides. 
and dark. Inside. Oh, wait, it's, it's not a new adventure. It's them just chatting about how great it was. What a Christmas treat. Maybe they had nothing better to do. OK, both the Emmas have done big films, but Daniel's barely acted since. Well, he has been in films, of course, but he's shit in all of them. At least he's consistent. And Ron Weasley's, um... Oh, he's had a kid and used it to promote some rubbish drama. Gave him a strange new perspective on a horror series. I don't want to know, mate. I mean, I'd expect this Potter love from the Murdoch press if old Roop still owned Sky, but he doesn't. Maybe it's still a hungover from those days. The Sun promises various recognisable cast members from the infamous film... Infamous films? Anyone check that before it went out? Or are they still a little peeved at having to pass this guff off as news? Got all the big names, though, I'm sure. A bit weird if they only had shit ones. Headmaster Dumbledore, right? Even I've heard of that one. Probably not got the late Richard Harris, but maybe the replacement Michael Gambon. No, can't see him. Oh, what about Jason Isaacs, the evil Lucius Malfoy? Oh. Any of the good directors? Nah, the one from the kiddie films. Oh, you do have those annoying twins who can't act. Well done. Sorry, bit harsh. No one can in this stuff. That's not all. Yes, for the real nerds, there's the four-part Harry Potter Hogwarts Tournament of Houses. Great, so the stars are facing off in a big quiz. No, it's the fans. And who's the host? Daniel Radcliffe? No, Helen Mirren. Great, she's the one from the uh, head of Gryffindor, the, the evil one in the fifth one. Ed Sheeran's mum? Ooh. Well done, everyone. You've found the only lovey in England who's not in any of them. Of course, Sky have all the Harry films for you to watch again and again and again and again. Kind of the point of this whole charade. Maybe stick with them instead. But what about the author who started it all? J.K. Rowling, she's bound to be involved. Would be strange to ignore her like so many of those who just rewrote the press release did. Oh, thanks, the mail. Yes, she's out, or Expelliarmus, if you prefer, after those controversial tweets about trans people. You know, the stuff the mail puts out all the time. Had a go at the term people who menstruate, amongst other things. Whilst her latest thriller, spoiler, features a male serial killer who disguises himself by putting on a dress. Lots of accusations of transphobia, which she denies. Many of the young Potter stars have spoken out in support of the trans community. We're told she will be in the Christmas stuff in archive footage, presumably taken before she wrote all the bad stuff. No, not the Potter books with the racist stereotypes. I'm afraid we're stuck with them. Yes, I did think the whole point of cancel culture was that we never had to hear from them again. But if you are stuck with a copy from back in the day, some people will give you £85,000 for it. Quick, flog it before the magic dries up. Do you still send Christmas cards? Not wise, right? Climate change, etc. All that wasted paper. Oh, you do? I'd probably put one of those family news things in too, don't you? Little Jimmy got a gold star in spelling. Little Jilly got the Nobel Prize for Literature. Little Johnny's been named in the Ashes Squad. I don't care! Politicians still do care, though. I'm sure they hate them just as much as me, but a political card is more about how you're perceived in the media than who actually gets one. Look at the Prime Ministers. Gone with the dog again. Good call. So much shit hitting the fan. Look, you can't criticise this little puppy, can you? Usually, PMs go with a family card. All the kids there, aren't we a lovely, shining example of traditional married bliss? But that's not really on for a guy whose life is littered with ex-wives, mistresses and... How many children is it now? At least he's got something a bit personal. His immediate and very private predecessor got a load of kids to design hers. Just lazy. She's done the same again this year. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer's card? It's not out yet, so I've done one for him. A lovely festive plank of wood. Solid, reliable and about as fun at parties as he is. That's not fair. You can have all kinds of excitement with a 2 by 4 Hope he writes something nice for his mate Piers Morgan. Last year, Piers got angry that Starmer had written Dear Friend rather than his actual name. Mate, you're lucky he called you that. What about Keir's predecessor, Santa Claus? I mean, Jeremy Corbyn. No, the Daily Mail, you can relax. I'm sure it's not that festive picture of him with the boys from Hamas. Ed Davey? Oh, the Lib Dem leader? Yeah, um, he probably just says Merry Christmas to all 12 of his MPs in person. And I wonder what message US Republican Congressman Thomas Massey was going for when he created this festive scene. And the tagline, Santa, please bring ammo. The right loved it. Maximum triggering. See what they did? while others pointed out how crass it was so soon after another high school shooting. In Massey's defence, there's one of those every few days. It's not the guns, it's the people, isn't it? The people who, um, have the guns. 
all a bit overtly violent for the festive season, surely. Get a bit more subtle, like the one where Cherie had to stop Tony glassing someone in a Weatherspoons. Give it a rest, ye merry gentlemen, and get out of my pub! <laughs> And now, my Scream of the Week. Well, that's it for now. You'll find plenty more updates and stories on our website at the usual address. Now, though, it's back to Naga and Charlie. I'm back in around half an hour. So that's me, Reese Lawton, and until next time, I will be watching the mainstream news so you don't have to. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss this! All of this! All of this wonder! Ah.